The issue of immigration stirs intense emotions today, as it has throughout much of American history. But what gets lost in the debates about policy are the stories of immigrants themselves, the people who are drawn to America by its promise of economic opportunity and political and religious freedom, and who strengthen our nation in countless ways. So begins former President George W. Bush in his new book, Out of Many, One, Portraits of America's Immigrants. In his just published, already New York Times bestseller, the president paints portraits and tells the stories of 43 immigrants. In the midst of the immigration controversy, we traveled to Dallas to ask the former president, why a book on immigration now? I'm Becky Ferguson, and this is One Question. Made possible with support by Pristine Organic Cleaners, Diamondback Energy, and West Texas National Bank. Former President George W. Bush painted 43 portraits of immigrants for his new book entitled Out of Many, One. Those words in Latin, E Pluribus Unum, our nation's motto, appear on the great seal of the United States. Why a book on immigration now? We traveled to Dallas to meet with the former president to ask him that question, and many others, including what the nation should do with regard to immigration policy, why he painted and told the stories of two Midlanders in the book, and how we can bridge our tribal divides to be kinder to one another and assume honorable motives on the parts of our political opponents. And we also talked about his post-presidential passion, painting. We met in the president's Dallas office. Thank you so much for visiting with us. I bought your book, of course, because I wanted to study your portraits. Then I downloaded the audio because I wanted to hear you tell the stories. And I love that I also got to hear the immigrants tell their stories. And I, uh, I laughed like, Mom, where are the nukes? <laughs> Hilarious. Or learning English from watching Seinfeld. Right. I was also so unbelievably touched by these stories and um, I also it also gave me a sense of gratitude and of patriotism good and I felt like um, it was so bold for you to write such an optimistic book <laughs> and I wondered why immigrants and why now well first of all why be optimistic and uh, the reason why is uh, I guess I spent a lot, enough time in Midland to be optimistic Remember when, we, when I first got out there, the sky is the limit, mm -hmm. which really conveys a sense of optimism. And in Midland, you can, you can see a long way. And I'm an optimistic guy, and I believe there, uh, even though we've been through a very dark period of time in American politics, that uh, better days lie ahead. Secondly, uh, I have always been interested in immigration. Uh, and uh, and I, I think I've got a pretty good feel for the vitality and energy somebody who's escaped tyranny brings to our country. And I was discouraged by the immigration debate, the tone of the immigration debate. And so this is my one attempt, or not one attempt, an attempt to elevate the discourse and hopefully get people to focus on uh, positive aspects. Becky, it really starts with uh, a core value of we're all God's children. and. Uh, I think if you start with that attitude, then all of a sudden it will enable you to view immigration not as a threat, but as an opportunity, opportunity for economic growth, an opportunity to enhance patriotism, and an opportunity to in increase compassion. I want to talk a little bit about your art. Okay. You have mentioned that you read uh, Winston Churchill's book, Painting as a Pastime. Right. And in his book, he talks about how you can rest the tired part of your brain by using another part of your brain. Yeah. So will you talk about the effect painting has on you? Well, it's definitely used another part of my brain. The weird thing is, is that I never thought that that part of the brain would be, uh, would ever get activated. And uh, it's changed my life uh, because 
you know, I see things differently, uh, and I'm in, I'm enthused because I'm learning so much. Uh, you're a painter, and as you know, every every brushstroke is a learning experience. Uh, secondly, uh, in order to be a better painter, you've got to study other painters, which in itself is a learning experience. And so, uh, I'm doing something that no one ever envisioned me doing, including my wife and close friends. And I'm doing it uh, enthusiastically. Uh, and so, yeah, it's changed me a lot. And Winston Churchill was the reason I started painting. I mean, I'm a big admirer of Churchill. Uh, and I figured if that guy can paint, I can paint. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I paint all the time. When you, I, I'm just amazed at your portraiture because I think that's a particularly uh, difficult thing to paint. When you start to paint somebody, what is important to get right? I mean, when somebody walks in or you see a picture of somebody, yeah. where are you starting? What's important? Well, the important thing is to make sure the eyes, nose, mouth uh, are, are, are positioned right. Uh, secondly, uh, I think the most important part of painting, of good painting, is to understand the story about the person you're painting. Uh, so like, uh, you know, in the, the immigrants, I knew their stories. And I studied their stories before I started painting. The first painting in there is a guy named Joseph Kim, a North Korean escapee. And you know, I don't know if I did this consciously or not, but when you look at his painting, uh, the darks are dark and the light is light. And in essence, you're painting a guy who's gone from darkness, North Korea, to light America. Oh, wow. And you know, I can't say I consciously did that. But I wouldn't have done that had I not known his story. And so I'm thinking about a kid escaping into China at the age of 14. And, uh, or Gene Lakin, who was terribly abused in Rwanda and yet is full of forgiveness. I mean, genuine forgiveness. And when you talk to her, there's no doubt she is a person who has unburdened her heart. And, uh, and so when I painted her, I tried to paint this kind of almost angelic look. And so, you, so to answer your question, first know the person you're painting. But from a tactical perspective, the eyes tell the story. And so I spent a lot of time learning how to paint eyes. And I've had good instructors helping me. Uh, and, uh, you know, how to make sure the eyes are shaped right. But also to make sure that, you know, the shadow in the eye itself uh, is done right. And uh, Well, you talk about your teachers when you're painting one of these portraits and you get to uh, a difficult point. Do you have somebody come in and, and look at it with you and help with critiques? Initially, I did. Uh, the thing about it is is that a, a portrait or a painting never ends. You just have to stop? Yeah, exactly. And so there's a lot of times I'll have painted portraits and, and an instructor comes by. And, uh, you know, I'll say, Jim or Cedric, uh, what do you think? And sometimes they say, it's, that's a good one. Or sometimes they say, well, have you thought about this? And then you repaint or move in. The thing about painting, uh, once you change a color, then you gotta change other colors that's next to it. And so, it, so you have to be disciplined enough to say enough's enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, the, initially, of course, I spent a lot of time with the instructors learning Technique. a lot of things. And as time goes on, uh, they, I've seen them less frequently because they're very busy. But uh, they'll come by and we'll talk about other artists. So they'll see me, so I have a lot of my things there in this art studio, and they look and say, oh, that reminds me of, you know, Georges Roulon or whatever. And then so we'll Google them. Let's and, look and see what you paint. Yeah. And so it's as much art history as well as uh, uh, spending time with them, encouraging me. Uh, with confidence, I've become a bolder painter. I mean, at first, I was kind of a, let's see if I can, I was a precise painter. Let's just you know, make sure that it looks exactly like it's supposed to look. And now I'm trying to get more artistic, uh, and, and that's just a matter of confidence. Well, your strokes are bold, yeah. and your colors are blocky, which I think are really interesting. Well, thank you. I mean, you're not fussing. Not fussing, that's a good way to put it. As my, one instructor keeps yelling at me, don't be fussy. But, uh, yeah, and I'm not trying to blend perfectly. I'm not a, I'm a, you know, Lucian Freud influenced yes. my painting. Yes, yes. And uh, Cedric Huckabee, a young painter out of Fort Worth, influenced my portrait painting. 
And they don't try to blend. They try to create, uh, you know, interesting art. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, and this book was a way of... So a buddy of mine said, we need your voice. And, you know, I'm, I don't want my voice. I mean, my voice was out there for eight years, and that's enough. And he said, well... And the reason why, Becky, is because I think that here's the great beauty of America. The institution of the presidency is more important than the occupant of the office, and it provides great stability. It has throughout the years and will continue to do so. And uh, uh, and I think it undermines the institution to have me second-guessing my successors, of which there are now three. Uh, but the guy said, well, why don't you paint the portraits of immigrants? He knew I was interested in immigration. I did. and uh, And so... Then this, I knew the stories, and I thought the stories would be instructive to Americans. I, I don't expect a lot of people to read this book, but to the extent they do, they've got to be impressed by uh, the courage, the compassion that others have shown them, uh, and their contribution to our country. I told you a minute ago that uh, the book made me feel very patriotic. It also made me very proud to walk among people who will help folks when they come here, yeah. recover and, and adjust. And that's important. And the key thing for you know people in Midland to understand is that every you know most everybody wants to enforce the border. I mean that's we, we're a nation of law, but in order to better enforce the border, we have to reform the system, and it's broken. And there's a better way. And you know I've got some suggestions in there. And what I hope happens is is that you know that uh, Congress will act finally and you know, take some baby steps toward a reform package that will ultimately yield to more border enforcement. So you think it should be incremental instead of comprehensive? Yeah, I do. I tried comprehensive in 06, uh, killed by the Democrats, by the way, uh, because they viewed it as a, uh, a labor union issue at the time. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think baby steps, DACA, or, you know, some of these, I mean, look, if you ask most Americans, should we be sending kids whose parents brought them here and who are educated and now have jobs, should we send them back home when they have no home? Most Americans will say, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. So if that's the case, why don't you just fix it? And that'll give people confidence and start plowing through all the politics of, uh, you know, an issue that's a hot button issue at times. Well, I know you noticed, like I did last week when the census was released, that the last decade was the slowest growth decade since yeah. the Depression yeah. because of low immigration and low birth rates. Right. So are we going to find ourselves in a position where we don't have enough workers? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that's why I'm for reforming the work program. I mean, look, it, there's people doing jobs that need to be done, and if there's a worker uh you know, verified worker program, they don't have to sneak across the border. They can come and work. And that will then make it easier to enforce the border. But here's the danger. Guys like me, and I'm not going to put you in this category, but, uh, you know, we, we're going to get our Social Security check. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and But there's not enough young workers right. to take care of the up-and-coming generation. So our kids, for example, you know, uh, may be given the, the ultimate false promise. And it requires young workers. And so, yeah, no question this is an economic issue. And, uh, I mean, here in the Metroplex, uh, it's booming. And I talked to a landscaper the other day who said, I'm looking for 150 workers. And, uh, and yet the system is bureaucratic and cumbersome, and uh, it, hurts, it hurts many small businesses not to be able to get workers they need. You have painted world leaders, I know, right after you left office. Right. <laughs> I want to ask you real quickly, did you get in trouble with any of them? Uh, uh, not really, thankfully. It's, uh, <laughs> the one that I was most in danger with was uh, uh, Angela Merkel, my dear friend, <laughs> yes. and uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, the reason why is painting women can be very delicate. And as you know, I tend to push paint hard. And therefore, sometimes if you're not careful, the features are not uh, delicate. And I think on those two, they were pleased with it. And uh, I looked back at them the other day, and some of them did what I wanted to do. I mean, if you look at Karzai's eyes, uh, they're pretty suspicious. Uh, uh, I'm really happy with the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. my dear my dear buddy. Uh, but yeah, no, that was an interesting moment. And it was a teaching moment because my instructor in introduced me to her instructor, a guy named Roger Winter. 
uh, and I had just been painting for maybe two years, and he came into my studio up there at the house and said, you ought to paint the leaders with whom you served. And it was a stunning comment by a very good artist, and I, uh, my first reaction was, wow, you think I can do that? He said, absolutely. And, you know, it gave me the confidence to try. And uh, so I spent a year painting them. And it was, uh, you know, it was interesting only because uh, it, it's not so much the artwork, but it's what did George Bush think of? You know, how did he relate to? And so they look at Angela and they'll say, well, he must have really liked her, which is true. I did. And then you painted veterans. And now... Painted okay. the vets? Yes. And so, yeah, uh, but this came about because Cedric Huckabee says, why don't you paint the portraits of people nobody knows? And I had been dealing with vets a lot, and I wanted to honor them, and so I painted 98 of them. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big uh, exhibit. It's got a, three large panels with, I don't know how many faces on them, a lot. And, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, it, it was an interesting uh, exercise. And, uh, you know, because many of them got hurt uh, as a result of my orders, and so I had this great bond with them. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to show courage. Uh, some of them were dealing with the invisible wounds of war. And, uh, you know, there's a guy in there. Uh, it's a pretty harsh painting of him. And I said, look, I met him uh, when I was selling the book, or saw him again when I was selling the book. And I said, I'm, you know, it's a tough painting. And he looked at it and said, that's how I used to feel, which was, you know, more in my soul. Yeah. Mm, I like that there was some past tense there. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking about when you were the governor. Yeah. And Bob Bullock was the lieutenant governor. Right. <laughs> and he didn't like very many people, but he liked you. Yeah, he and liked you me liked him. A lot. And y'all worked together. Yeah. And then I'm thinking you went to Washington and you worked with Ted Kennedy to pass the wonderful education bill. Right. And so I'm wondering, uh, in these polarized times, uh, what can we do to find uh, kindness and the assumption of good intentions on yeah. the part of our political opponents? Yeah, see, that's a really good question, and that's what's missing right now. Uh, but it takes time to work these moments out of our system. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, part of the last election, particularly here in these congressional districts up here, was uh, surely we can be kinder to each other. And so what's interesting is you, if you look at the results, the president didn't do very well, but underneath, uh, at the state house and stuff, Republicans did do well, and so to me that's a, a sign that parts of the electorate, you know, expected something better out of the leadership in terms of treating each other with respect. Uh, and so I think, you know, I believe that's still going to be important to voters as time goes on. It just takes time to work through the system. Of 43 paintings, why two Midlanders? Well, because these are people I know and admire their story. First of all, Javed Anwar is one of the more generous people I know. And uh, uh, he's a guy that was in Pakistan and goes to the University of Wyoming, raised by a single mother. And he had a dream. And uh, he worked hard and has uh, done very well in the oil and gas business. And he's done very well in the generosity field. Bobby Fu uh, was uh, harassed as a result of his faith in China. and. Uh, uh, you know, he ends up in America by chance. He would say the grace of God. And, uh, uh, and he is still active in terms of uh, holding uh, governments that don't believe in freedom of religion to account. And uh, so I admire uh, Bobby, Bob, I shouldn't call him Bobby, Bob Foo's courage. And, uh, you know, I think they're interesting stories. And I think that it's a part of the kind of general theme of the book which is people who take extraordinary uh, risks to realize dreams. And when they come to the country, they're not only uh, you know, good citizens, but they help others. Uh, and so I'm glad you put him, I'm glad you're gonna talk to him. I am too. One more thing, over the weekend, I was with my daughter and son-in-law and I had just listened to your book. And so I kept relaying different stories that touched me and my daughter said, Mom, you really need to ask the president to relay a story. Okay. So will you relay a story that particularly moved you? Well, I, I mentioned Gene Lakin, uh, but Gilbert uh, of Austin, Texas. I got to know Gilbert because uh, 
Jenna told me about this inspiring man who got her to run every Saturday morning when she was a senior at Texas. And I said, this guy's got to be really inspiring <laughs> to get Jenna out of bed. And uh, so his story is this. Uh, he was a, a champion runner as a, as a young guy in Burundi. Uh, the uh, Hutu Tutsi crisis just was emerging. He's a Tutsi, and uh, Hutu classmates of his and others, obviously instigators, locked all the Tutsi students in a schoolhouse and burned it. And 30% of his body gets burned. He gets out and he runs to a hospital and hides from the Hutu thugs. Eventually, uh, he ends up uh, at Abilene Christian on a track scholarship. And the interesting thing about go, and he met Paul, who started Run Tex in Austin. And so he started Gilbert's Gazelles, which is a running club. And uh, he has inspired a lot of people because he is such a genuinely decent man. He could have been full of hate, full of anger, but he's not. And uh, he also raises money to uh, drill, uh, find clean water for Burundi villages. In other words, you never forget where he came from. So one of the things about immigration that's important is people can become fully American, but they don't have to forget their past. Uh, you know, you can honor your traditions. I learned that firsthand from Paolo Rendon, who uh, was with our family for 60 years. And uh, not quite 60, uh, 50 years, a long time. And uh, 1959 till recently. And, uh, and she was like a second mother. She came with nothing. She left three kids in Mexico. She worked hard, brought them to the United States. Uh, they became citizens. Uh, her son was a U.S. Marine. And, uh, uh, and there's generations of her offspring in Houston. Uh, and yet, and she was very proud of her uh, Mexican tradition, traditions, but she was also a patriotic, proud American. And uh, she was my first introduction to, to an immigrant. And I saw how hard she worked uh, and how decent she was. And as Daro said, you know, I cried more at Paola's funeral than my mother's. Oh, yeah. I love that. You're the best. Thank you. For over 117 years, West Texas National Bank has been serving the needs of West Texas. West Texas National Bank is a proud supporter of Basin PBS and our local communities. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender, WTMB.com. When it comes to dry cleaning, Pristine Organic Cleaners is the Permian Basin's only organic dry cleaner. We're your one-stop shop for dry cleaning, laundry, household services, tailoring, and alterations. Our Easy Drop Garmento bags make leaving your clothes a cinch. Whether home delivery or corporate concierge service drop-off and pickup, we take the fuss out of dry cleaning. Because what you put on your body is just as important as what you put in your body. Diamondback Energy, an independent oil and natural gas company headquartered in Midland, strives for excellence in all we do. Diamondback Energy supports Basin PBS and our Permian Basin communities. Among the 43 portraits of immigrants the president painted for his book are two Midlanders, Bob Fu and Javed Anwar. Fu, a persecuted Christian refugee from China, and Anwar, an immigrant from Pakistan. I'm visiting with Bob Fu, the founder of China Aid, and on this particular occasion, I'm talking to you because uh, you were one of the 43 portraits that President Bush painted and included in his book, Out of Many One. So I want you to tell your story, and if you will, start off by telling us how did you come to be named Bob? Yeah, well, thank you so much um, for the interview. And I'm very honored, of course, to be uh, included as uh, one of the many uh, immigrants uh, in this book by uh, President Bush. Uh, this name, Bob, uh, actually was uh, picked up um, in a random drawing uh, uh, when our American English teachers in our college uh, try to, of course, identify uh, the uh, Chinese students, um, but it's hard for them to remember the Chinese names, right? So we got our name by, you know, drawing a lot. Uh, the girls has one basket of uh, English names, the boys has another. So my first draw was Joseph. I'm, you know, 
when I draw it, I saw, Joseph, that's too complicated to remember. So I treated my holy name Joseph with my desk mate, uh, Bob. That's how I got my name, Bob. If you will, tell us how it was that you came to leave China and why you had to leave. Yeah, we uh, left China uh, purely because of the religious persecution. Um, you know, I was uh, uh, one of the Tiananmen Square student leaders uh, because of the political persecution. In 1989, after the massacre, I uh, became a follower of Christ. Um, and uh, through the help of our American uh, English teachers who are Christians. And then later on, uh, we, my wife and I started an uh, underground house church in Beijing and uh, then uh, established an underground Bible training school. That led both my wife and I arrested uh, and imprisoned for two months. And um, later on, after we were released, and they immediately put under house arrest, especially after we found, um, I mean, my wife was pregnant uh, without a pregnancy permission card. Is you know, China's family planning system, uh, unless you have a specific quota uh, to get a, a legal pregnancy, the mother will face the, uh, 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 forced abortion. I mean, literally, several hundreds of millions. It's, it's, it's not uh, really um, kind of, um, oh, it's hard for me even to think about that. Uh, the Chinese government even admitted at least uh, over 130 million were Chinese children were forcefully uh, aborted. Uh, so we don't want to see our first child to be first forcefully aborted, um, so we uh, fled out of our apartment in Beijing at uh, midnight. I had a almost a you know double O seven type of escape by climbing uh, the uh, the toilet room of, and the window and uh, uh, in the dark night I stepped with a really a leap of faith uh, just to uh, uh, drop myself um, to the um, build, you know down to the building outside and even passed out for a few seconds. And uh, so Heidi was pregnant. She has to disguise herself. We fled out of Beijing. And essentially, by God's grace, miraculously, we were able to fly to Hong Kong uh, before Hong Kong was turned over to China. Our boy, our son Daniel, was born uh, in 1997. And uh, then three days before Hong Kong was turned over to China, we were uh, admitted as uh, refugees uh, to the United States, landing this uh, land of the free. Uh, really, uh, we have we're forever thankful to this country. Uh, you know, it's a warm welcome uh, into America. Yeah, you um, pay that back, I think, by uh, continuing to help refugees in China. Could you talk a little bit about your work? Yes, you know, one of the features of uh, China Aid Mission, we call it a 3E mission, is uh, to expose the abuses of the persecution, to encourage the abused, and to equip the leaders. Basically, you know, we call ourselves as uh, the, uh, to walk with the persecuted faithful um, by advancing religious freedom for all faiths and to, uh, I mean, our, uh, our kind of motto is uh, religious freedom for anyone, anywhere, at any time. So that's uh, when we uh, found uh, if those religious uh, uh, persecuted faithful uh, who are facing imminent danger, life-threatening, and if, if we uh, got a chance and able, we would rescue them to safety. And so some uh, are rescued to the United States. Uh, in the past uh, uh, kind of um, uh, nearly 20 years or so, we rescued a few hundred already. Uh, the latest one, we rescued a, a Kazakh uh, Muslim family uh, who the mother was uh, uh, put in the concentration camp. You know, the Chinese government is engaging this uh, genocide and uh, a crime against humanity to this Uyghur and Kazakh and other minority groups 
between one to three million, uh, according to the Pentagon, are estimated uh, right now in these uh, uh, over 380 concentration camps in West China called Xinjiang. So this uh, lady, her name is Guo Zero, so she spent over 15 months in the concentration camp and not only herself uh, was abused uh, heavily, but uh, she also eyewitnessed uh, this uh, tremendous torture I mean, crime uh, basically is a state-sponsored um, forced prostitution against uh, these uh, ladies in the concentration camp. So after I heard about this, I contacted with our partner organization in Kazakhstan, because this lady has a Kazakh uh, husband um, in Kazakhstan. So she uh, uh, left China after signing you know, uh, agreement with the Chinese government after her husband, of course, uh, had been making advocacy and appeal to the international community. Um, so we, um, just uh, February this year, uh, we uh, rescued her um, out of uh, Turkey and after, you know, we kind of uh, got her out. And um, yeah, she's and you brought now her, in Midland, Texas. You brought her to Midland. Yeah, with um, a five-year-old daughter and her husband here. and uh, her. Daughter just uh, started her uh, first time in an uh, English-speaking school, happily in a public school in Midland. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the government involvement in rescuing refugees? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. government, right? Um, uh, for, I mean, we are, of course, uh, our family and many of uh, um, those uh, who are persecuted are the uh, beneficiaries and also witnessing uh, this, uh, the, the program um, of uh, really generosity and compassion of the American people uh, for accepting, resettling uh, those uh, really hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, over the years. And, um, uh, you know, myself and our, our, our uh, Heidi, my wife, and our two-month-old baby Daniel, as I mentioned, when we came here, uh, is, is part of that. And uh, thank God for, you know, Bill Clinton, actually. He was the one uh, made a very uh, daring uh, decision. Um, uh, when we were stuck in Hong Kong, we could be returned to Chinese prison uh, without that decision. And, um, but over the years, I, I, I certainly, you know, it, it's, uh, I have never thought it's uh, become a, a little a political uh, kind of a, a dispute. Uh, um, I mean, I just felt, you know, uh, this should never be uh, because we are a country a melting pot, right, uh, uh, immigrants. I mean, from early years, of the, 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 the Puritans, like the early fathers, they're from, you know, different areas. And then we have uh, Italians, we have Irish, we have different, you know, uh, country of origin. Um, but all of a sudden it becomes a, a political issue. Uh, it's really uh, very hard um, uh, for me to observe. And especially, uh, you know, honestly, I felt uh, you know, I'm a registered Republican, and uh, this is one uh, key issue I would uh, really disagree uh, with uh, what uh, the uh, previous administration handled. I think uh, we are still the most powerful, most compassionate uh, country on earth. Uh, we can and should, uh, you know, open our arm to uh, accept more refugees than, you know, 15 uh, thousand or, or so, and uh, so, uh, or maybe even less, I think, uh, in the past few years. Um, so I feel um, we, um, it's, it's, it's life changing. And it's also not only, I mean, we're talking about, I think the critics talk about public charge, you know, feeling maybe, you know, some of those immigrants or refugees uh, will burden our welfare social security system. And um, it could be, you know, if we do not have a good vetting system, and it could even pose some, you know, national security thing. I mean, like the September 11th is a good example, you know. But at the same time, uh, we can't just uh, let our kind of uh, 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 our worry 
to occupy our compassion. And um, uh, we can do a better job in vetting, but at the same time, you know, we, uh, this, uh, most of these uh, refugees or immigrants, I mean, they're hardworking people. I mean, they are contributing to this society. And uh, I, you know, for myself, uh, when we came here, um, we were given a, a car by a Christian businessman in Philadelphia um, without even asking. And he provided a house for us to stay before he gave a house to his own son. And he uh, started, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving us some uh, cash support. And so uh, to the point, we even feel so guilty. And uh, when I was able to find a job as a student um, doing some gardening work uh, for a local doctor, I asked him to take off the insurance policy. I said, I can pay for the insurance policy and I want to be uh, really independent. And uh, so this kind of a spirit, I think, uh, of the immigrants, um, especially in the refugee community, I just think uh, it will make this country better and stronger and really more prosperous if we handle it more properly. Uh, so that's my take. It's a lovely take. How is it that you ended up in Midland? Yeah, well, many people uh, ask that question. I was even asked uh, during several congressional hearings that you belong to Washington, D.C. or uh, New York or London uh, or somewhere uh, because we have an international presence uh, and um, as a mission to advance religious freedom, uh, China Aid has been um, you know, holding this mission. Um, it, was, it happened exactly actually because of this community's generosity and uh, enormous uh, love and compassion. In 2004, I um, went to DC and organized a, a conference uh, with uh, some senior persecuted house church leaders and ended up uh, meeting with a group of uh, um, Texans and from the ministry, uh, it's called the Midland Ministerial Alliance, mm -hmm led by a uh, self-claimed housewife, Deborah Fikes. And anyway, so that's the first time I know the existence of Midland. So, you know, <laughs> kind of a, and uh, we end up meeting together because there was an anthrax scares that day. And uh, Senator, uh, then Senator Sam Brownback and uh, Congressman Frank Wolf kind of met with us uh, uh, as a group together. And when they learned that uh, you know, China Aid was operating uh, from our yard, <laughs> basically, and uh, without any assistant, assistance or staff, they said, uh, they made their Texans offer, said, can you come over for a visit? But one visit, we drove from Philadelphia, uh, our family, all the way to uh, Midland, uh, Texas, and then yeah, we fell in love with Texans, especially in this community, uh, without hesitation. I mean, we kind of uh, made our move. Uh, we have never regretted it. I mean, this is uh, such a... I told uh, uh, everyone when I travel around the world uh, the, the story about this a small city, but with big dreams. Everybody wants to change the world in the Permian Basin uh, community. I witnessed that. I kind of feel that every day you know, we are loved and empowered uh, to help those uh, poor, needy, and oppressed for freedom from China, North Korea, Sudan, you know, all over the world. I mean, this is the headquarter. Uh, I basically. love that. How did you get to know the president? Yeah, well, um, it was uh, interesting. I, after meeting with, uh, of course, uh, Miss Deborah Fikes and uh, came, uh, I mean, I learned, uh, I studied, oh, this is the hometown of George W. and uh, Laura Bush. Uh -huh. And Laura Bush was even born here. They have their uh, Bible study meeting. Uh, that's Don Evans who is here. Yeah. So, so uh, kind of uh, General Tommy Franks is also here. A lot of famous people are here. But the most uh, you know, fascinating thing I uh, kind of um, learned was uh, when we had our um, major test of uh, a house church Christian persecution, uh, I think that was the year 2000, 2002, 2004, I mean 2002 to 2004, 
Anyway, so we had, um, I mean, five church leaders sentenced to death. And then, you know, we made appeal and then somehow the end up, the case end up at President Bush's desk. And uh, later on, he himself intervened. And uh, yeah, the, all the five death sentenced uh, church leaders were, uh, I mean, commuted, uh, basically several a few to life sentence, a few to uh, the, some other years. Uh, and uh, then in 2000, um, let's see. So after we moved to Midland, of course, we have more interaction with the mm -hmm. White House. And I also found uh, some, a uh, few friends end up working for him at the National Security Council. So we start organizing the uh, Chinese human rights lawyers and uh, uh, house church leaders and writers. You know, dissidents uh, to the U.S. Every time the White House opened the door, mm -hmm. I mean, every time. I mean, like uh, sometimes we don't need even to uh, make a, a pre-scheduled uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, a phone call appointment. I, I just call them and they open the house, open the White House. I, I was joking. They said, you know, White House is like our house. Uh, it was just uh, then 2008, President Bush invited us uh, actually to the White House uh, before he and Laura went to Beijing Olympics. He wants to know the persecution, and uh, I gave him say, some assignment. <laughs> so, and uh, after he got retired uh, in, in, in Dallas, he invited us again uh, quite a few times uh, to. One time, he even asked me to uh, introduce Laura Bush at the, a big kind of a news event in D.C. I love that. Uh, from the hometown. Wow. <laughs> said, hometown yeah, because of the home, yeah, hometown yeah. boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Introducing the hometown girl. Yeah, and he gave me a, a nickname every time he. Uh, uh -huh. what, what, did, what was your nickname? Called, um, yeah, the Bobby the Fighter. He said, I love that. Here's the Bobby the Fighter. Bobby you know, the Fighter. Always, yeah. So we enjoy our relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So happy to be visiting with Javid Anwar, who is the founder of Petroplex and Midland Energy. And when we interviewed the president, he said, Javid Anwar is one of the most generous men I have ever met. He tells in his book stories of your generosity beginning back in Pakistan. Can you t tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was raised by a single mother. Uh, my f mother and father were separated, and I was lucky enough to live with my grandparents. And that way we had very good food and shelter. My mother worked as a telephone operator, making very little money. Uh, I lived in Pakistan, and it's a poor country. We have beggars knock on the door, ask for food. So my mother and grandmother may be eating food or may have saved food for later on. And what they do, they just wrap that food, give it to the poor people who were asking for food. And I asked my mother or grandmother, oh, you didn't eat? No, no, they say, we have already eaten. So I learned how they try to help poor people from very early childhood. The president also mentions when he tells your story that uh, your mom was very committed to your education and spent most of the money she earned on your education. And she had the great hope that you would become a doctor, but you ran into a stumbling block, I understand, in the eighth grade. That's right. That's right, because I, I took some bi biology classes. The names were so big, I just didn't like it. So I said, no way, I'm going to become a doctor. So I decided to go in engineering. And as I recall, you began in nuclear engineering. And how did you come to decide on that? And, and how did you get to America? Well, um, I, was, uh, I was very much interested in energy. So I thought nuclear energy was really upcoming. And I wanted to become a nuclear engineer. And I, I applied for nuclear engineering at University of Wyoming. I got admitted. I want to live in Wyoming. It's a cold and very, you know, very nice place to live because I am born and raised at a tropical place, Karachi, Pakistan, which never goes below 60 degrees most of the time. It gets very hot and humid. 
So I thought Wyoming will be an ideal place to go and live there. And I started my nuclear engineering first semester. Uh, after the first semester, I had a break. I went to see some people in California. Another graduate from my university, I knew him real well, uh, told me, uh, I said, where do you work? He said, I'll show you where I work. He took me down to a nuclear sub, and I said, that's where you work? He said, I stay here six months or more down in the sea. I said, no way. I decided not to do nuclear engineering right after that. And then what did you decide to do? I decided to become a petroleum engineer. And then what brought you to West Texas? Well, I had an offer, job offer in, uh, in California, and I thought it will be some place like Santa Barbara where I can work on the rigs during the day in the field and go swim with the girls in the ocean. But it turned out to be a Bakersfield, which gets very hot, dusty, um, temperature over 120 degrees. When I land there to interview the Getty guy, I told him, oh, I have another job offer. I don't want to. So that's why I decided to come to Houston, Texas. I was interviewing in Houston. Houston is just like my hometown, Karachi. It gets hot and humid. I said, oh, no. I made a mistake. So somebody told me, go to Midland, Texas. So I came here. First day, I was offered a job by Roy Williamson. The president also talks about in his story about you that um, that you worked for lots of different oil companies and moved around in West Texas to, I think, Abilene and Amarillo. But then you decided, because of the ups and downs of the oil business, that you would rather have your own oil business than depend on other people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I worked here in Midland for two plus years. Then I got a job with Santa Fe Energy. And, you know, I was very happy in Amarillo. Um, within a few years, they made me chief engineer at that company. And so I have a lot of people working for me who are much older than me. But then they decided to move the head office to Houston. And I didn't want to live in Houston. So I decided to quit. Then I went to Pampa, Texas. And after that, what I saw in Pampa, one day I was having a lunch with a few uh, colleagues and they, Pampa is only like 60 miles from Amarillo. Uh, my ex boss was Wayne Kelly. They said, Do you know what, hap what, what happened to Wayne Kelly? I said, No, I don't know. I said, One, um, Mr. Kelly was an excellent boss, one of my very good friends, you know, and mentor. He said, the, You know, one day they came in on a Friday, late after years of 30 plus years of service, they let him go. I said, so where is he working? He said, you don't even know that. I said, no, I don't know where he is. He said, he passed away. I, I said, in his 50s, I was just shocked. And he had a kid in college, some in high school. And then I see the trend because our gas prices were, oh, natural gas prices were $10 per thousand cubic feet or per MCF. It dropped after President Reagan deregulated gas and oil. It went down to $1. And all those big gas projects that we were drilling with $10 gas, they start laying off all these senior people who had a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, you know, and I said, I don't want to go through this when I'm in my 50s or late 40s or 50 plus, whatever. I said, I'm going to go start my own oil company and give it a try. One of my favorite um, parts of the story about you and the president's book is he talks about how you went back to Pakistan to visit your mother and that you were wearing a very fancy suit and your mother took great exception to that. And what did she tell you? Well, um, um, I was working. I had good money. I had a very good job, all kind of benefits. So I got used to getting custom-made suits. So I did wear a very expensive uh, out, outfit. And she said, 
my God, you look nice, but you know, do you know how much you paid for it? At that time, I told her, yeah, like 25,000 for this suit. She said, oh my God, 25,000 for a suit? You know how many poor people you can feed with $25,000? I said, I didn't think that way that she would. So she told me, you know, these expensive suits and expensive cars are okay, but think of poor people. If you're blessed, let's share it. That's what she told me. So, you know, but she was very, she, she would, if she had, for example, if she has ten dollars to her, she would give it away to some poor person. So you uh, come by your generosity honestly, and I believe we've uh, talked about the reason. One of the reasons the president is so grateful for your generosity is he's familiar with all the things that you do in Midland and things that you've done for his library. And can you talk a little bit about some of the projects that you've been involved in? Yes, I was uh, involved with. Uh, Initially, let me tell you, we were flying from New York back to Midland and he said uh, his daughter Barbara Bush is starting a foundation. So he told me he gave so much money and I said, okay. He said, how much would you give? So I gave more than him. He said, really? So he was very impressed. He said, you mean it? I said, yeah. Anyway, but he knew from Don Evans that I have given for UT engineering school to build a new facilities, millions of dollars, and I have done charity for his library and a lot of other institutes that need help. I read again in the story that when you graduated, you had always assumed that you would go back to Pakistan, but you decided not to because of the attitude Pakistanis have toward people like you and your mother. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, generally, you know, when you, when in that part of the world, it, it's like a family who has got lots of money, they get privileged treatment, you know, and they get jobs much easier than an ordinary person. So I was an ordinary person. So I thought about going back and then they, asked my references and all this stuff. I told one of the guys on the telephone, well, if you, if you need me for my qualification, fine. I don't have no big references. Then I decide just to stay here, get training and see what comes up. And um, I assume you have been pleased by the opportunities that you've had here. Sure, I was very pleased, you know. Uh, I worked first, first job with, Roy Williamson, he's a gentleman and lives in town. In fact, he lives right across from me. I used to envy him because when I started working for him, he had a red Corvette, a plane, and uh, custom-made suits. I always want to be Roy Williamson. Well, I would say that you have succeeded in that. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, God has been very, uh, bless, have blessed me with a lot of opportunities. In fact, my first well that I told my investors going to come in 30 barrels a day, came in flowing 300 barrels of oil per day. So that was a miracle. There was a lot of other uh, things that happened in my life that God has a great hand in it. Uh, I can take full credit for it, but no, it could not happen without his help. The president's book might well be mistaken for just a beautiful coffee table book, but it is much more. It is powerful in the telling of grim but inspirational stories of refugees escaping unspeakable circumstances to be welcomed by open-handed Americans, immigrants who, with the help of generous citizens, work hard to become successful citizens who go on to pay it forward. You'll recognize some of the portraits, Henry Kissinger, Madeleine Albright, Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, though you might not know their stories. But there are dozens less famous whose portraits and stories are perhaps more compelling. So the book is worth the look and the read, but for the most powerful experience of Out of Many One, one should also listen to the audio read by President Bush 
along with the voices of the immigrants. I laughed and I cried and I felt patriotic and proud. What could be better? For our art segment this week, we present portraits of the immigrants President Bush painted for his book. They are currently on exhibit at the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas through January of next year. While you look, I will read The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, which is cast in bronze at the base of the Statue of Liberty. It also appears next to a portrait of the statue in the President's book. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thank you for joining us for this season of One Question. I'm Becky Ferguson, good night. Made possible with support by Pristine Organic Cleaners, Diamondback Energy, and West Texas National Bank.